So, uh, good morning to everybody. It's a pleasure to see all of you here. And it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Yuri Nikulin from the Department of Mathematics and Statistics of the University of Turku in Finland. Uh, Professor Nikulin has uh, around 50 papers and uh, works in uh, different uh, areas uh, from multi-objective uh, optimization, multi-criteria, uh, also discrete uh, mathematics, uh, combinatorics, and some of uh, uh, his interests are uh, related to computer science. And uh, today he will talk uh, uh, about uh, one of these subjects uh, oriented to computer science. So uh, it is uh, uh, our pleasure to have you here, and we are yours. Uh. Good afternoon, everybody. And first of all, let me express my sincere gratitude to organizers, to Juan and Maria Josefa for inviting me here and giving me this nice opportunity to deliver my presentations among such a big audience. In Finland, we rare have so many people at our seminars, so I am really privileged. Uh, so, and... Um, uh, actually, it's not my first time in Spain. I have been uh, already many times visiting your beautiful country. So, and two times I was um, in Alicante, which is quite near to Elche. Mm -hmm. So, and um, Marco Antonio was uh, my host of uh, those two visits. And I was doing Erasmus exchange program and teaching classes uh, on multi-objective optimization and some artificial intelligence in, um, uh, for his students and students from his department. So, and um, today uh, I am going to talk about um, uh, efficient routing in dynamic network. Uh, actually, um, the, this is a major part of that work was done by um, my PhD student, Alalem Maskuki, I was supervising her doctoral thesis and now her doctoral thesis is uh, ready and we plan um, in spring that defense will come. So, and this uh, work also was done in a close cooperation between um, several uh, departments. So, uh, um, the money and um, the project was coming from um, Faculty of Technology, uh, former name uh, of the department uh, was uh, Future Technology Department, and Professor Yuko Heikonen was a leader of that project. So, and then we have been cooperating very closely with uh, some other departments and with Professor Marco Calio, so from uh, Altar Business School, and also with uh, Professor Kalyan Moidab from Michigan State University. So uh, let me start uh, my talk. So, and um, first I want to um, kind of make preliminaries uh, about the subject, and I want to uh, discuss our motivation. The motivation for the project uh, comes from uh, growing awareness about ecological situation um, with air pollution. So, and uh, for example, in 2019, in a central newspaper uh, in Finland, Helsinki in Sanamat, there was an article uh, published, and the article was saying that uh, the largest one largest cruise shipping company, sulfur emission uh, into European waters was uh, 10 times more than uh, all the cars in total producing uh, this um, uh, gas pollutant uh, in Europe. So, and also another kind of bad numbers uh, that uh, overall all shipping uh, is responsible for over 3% of global greenhouse emission. And if we compare, for example, um, uh, how uh, much gas pollutant different countries produce. So if we take 
small countries like Latvia, Luxembourg, and Cyprus together, so their total uh, gas emission will be equal to the total gas emission of 200 uh, vessels um, in, um, uh, in European waters. So uh, after that, uh, after understanding that um, the ecological situation should be moni monitored over the Baltic, so we came to a, a, a situation when our government wants a constant surveillance on, um, uh, um, on uh, vessels uh, which are uh, in the Baltic Sea navigating and they also want to uh, measure how much gas uh, they pollute. So, uh, because um, uh, without this, uh, well, unfortunately, um, there might be some kind of uh, um, situation when um, ships are um, producing more gas than, than needed. So, and this is, um, has to be closely monitored um, by uh, governmental governmental institutions. So here you can see the area of the sea between uh, rough, uh, between seashore of Finland and Estonia. So and surveillance is done in uh, the rectangle area. So and um, we basically, as a research question, we want to know how to navigate efficiently a, a surveillance boat. Uh, which will approach each ship, if possible, uh, passing through this area and measuring as many ships as, as we can and do it in the shortest uh, possible distance. So I will uh, here want to show you some animation. Uh, basically, the situation looks like this. We have a depot, harbor, this is our um, measurement boat, as we name it, and we are trying to approach uh, ships uh, passing through the area and uh, do, do the measurement. So I think the idea is clear. So let me continue. So we were supplied from uh, that company um, who is doing uh, monitoring um, with some prior information which we have to fit. Uh, so the working day uh, is usually one or two shifts, uh, the so-called captain shifts, uh, usually lasting uh, somewhere between 8 to 16 hours. So the work area um, is 27 by 32 square nautical miles. Uh, then we have to make a route prediction. Uh, we have to um, calculate uh, in which area of, uh, of that zone, working zone, uh, the ships uh, will be passing through. And then uh, uh, measurement uh, usually lasts at least two, three minutes. This is the minimal time required for uh, measurement to be done correctly. And uh, then the speed of the boat, uh, measurement boat, um, is uh, usually uh, somewhere between 20 to 30 knots. And speed of the vessels which are passing through the area ranges from 8 to 25. So, Sorry. yeah. Two or three minutes for measurement? It's yeah. Too, too short. Uh, it's which kind of measure? Uh, no, uh, basically, as a situation like the boat approaching a ship, yeah. so and it's standing um, from the side uh, where wind uh, goes in front, uh -huh. so and um, it constantly measuring uh, the air and make uh, some calculation and calculate the amount of uh, pollutant in in this air. So for that, uh, two, three minutes is needed. It's a, it's a minimal, minimal time. Um, uh, and um, usually uh, this type of uh, problem um, is, is done, we call it approach problem, and it is done by um, different uh, tools. So it's not a part of, of, of this model. So. Um, 
Anyway, so we uh, should have some kind of model which will construct uh, root prediction based on historical data. Historical data are obtained uh, through this automated identification system and was kindly provi uh, provided to us um, by that Finnish transport infrastructure agency Vaila. So, and using this data uh, and using some statistical uh, methods, uh, filtering data and k-nearest neighborhood uh, heuristics, so uh, we were able to construct a prediction model and uh, use um, uh, some kind of interpolation for that. Uh, and this, you can find uh, details of this model in this publication, but uh, I am not going to talk in details about uh, root prediction today. So uh, today I want to concentrate on uh, routing problem. Uh, after analyzing the problem and uh, reading literature about it, we understood that the problem is a sort of new variant of dynamic uh, traveling salesman problem with some uh, very specific uh, features um, which basically reflects um, the case um, situation. So uh, the number of targets may change over time so the, the vessels can appear and disappear from the working zone so they also have uh, so-called time windows uh, so that we can measure one particular tar target within those time windows. Otherwise, after that um, measurement is not possible. Then also visiting all vessels uh, in the area, passing through the area is not uh, possible. This is quite understandable. Um, therefore, we decided to formulate the model as a bi-objective optimization model with the two particular objectives. Um, we want to maximize the number of measured ships and we want to minimize uh, the total travel distance. So, and of course, uh, uh, combinatorics of our problem is uh, to determine the subset order and time slots of targets which have to be visited in a, in a sequence. So, and today I am going to talk about two main contributions. Uh, so the first contribution introduces integer linear programming model for dynamic TSP. And the second contribution relates to the fast methods to solve large scale instances. So uh, evolutionary uh, genetic algorithm, multi-objective version of it, uh, which is known as NSGA2, non-dominated sorted genetic algorithm. So the first uh, contribution can, is, is published, so uh, back to 2020 in control and cybernetics. And now I will present some of this, uh, some of this, um, results. Uh, first of all, uh, a little bit uh, about notation. So, okay, n is a, be a number of uh, vessels which appear in, in a measurement zone. We have a time horizon, so usually it can be a minimal one, two hours, maximum <coughs> is 16 hours. So we use a discretization of time with uh, uh, time granularity five minutes. <coughs> so the, uh, the uh, size step uh, along timeline is five minutes and uh, then correspondingly we have a number of time slots uh, index which enumerates all the time slots index k and then we have a uh, vector position which has uh, two indices lower subscript uh, denotes uh, basically uh, the vertex uh, the um, basically the node or the vessel i uh, and index k enumerates time slot k and zero is reserved for the depot. Then we have uh, distance, um, distance uh, between uh, node i at 
time slot k and node j at time slot l. So it should be read like this, j in l uh, and i in k. So uh, the distance is uh, usual Euclidean distance. The Euclidean norm is used. So um, then we consider the speed of uh, travel of the measurement boat, boat as uh, constant. And then we have also uh, traveling time uh, for the measurement boat between locations. Uh, so this will be our parameter delta. And our decision variable, which is a binary decision variable, uh, it is equal to 1 if job j at time slot L is scheduled immediately after job i at time slot k. So this is a binary decision variable. We have another uh, decision variable which relates to uh, scheduling part of our model, uh, variable which can have uh, non-negative values. Uh, SK uh, means the start time uh, of measuring if it is done at stage K. So, and also we have time, uh, time windows associated with every node as we as I mentioned, this is one of the specific of that model. So uh, overall, the situation looks like this. We have trajectories, predicted um, locations in the different time slots for our ships. And uh, we have our measurement boat. And at one particular moment, we decide uh, to which location we are going to, we are going to uh, swim and uh, which ship we are going we are going to measure. So this is the decision which we make uh, at moment at moment of time slot k. So uh, then from um, if we analyze combinatorics of our problem, so then uh, we understand that it can be represented through a multi-layered graph where each layer represents uh, the time slot indexing with k and uh, nodes uh, um, basically represents coordinates of, uh, of the vessels which we are going to, to measure. So, and uh, there are links which can go from one layer to another layer yeah, so this is, uh, we basically have to decide which links <coughs> are active and which are not. Yeah? And then uh, we basically um, have a so-called admissible uh, link. So those links which gives us a sufficient uh, time to do their measurement and then to travel uh, also uh, the distance uh, from uh, from node i to node j. Yeah. So, and the model, as I said, uh, which we are going to construct is a bi-objective model. So it <coughs> means that we plan to generate a so-called Pareto frontier, the set of uh, <coughs> points which are usually non-dominated non -dominated points. So two objectives, uh, minimization of a total travel distance uh, is considered. Uh, this is our kind of um, one objective. And the other objective is a maximi maximization of total number of uh, measured uh, vessels. So in terminology of scheduling theory, we can term them as jobs. So, and we are maximizing uh, the total number of jobs to be, to be done. Um, also, if we think about uh, topology of our solution, so we are basically dealing with a Hamiltonian circuit, so which uh, basically starts at depot and ending node is depot, and then we have a sequence uh, of uh, vessels uh, which are approached at some time time slot so and uh, we are trying to build um, to build our model on the set of such um, feasible Hamiltonian circuits yeah. so 
This is quite uh, usual uh, TSP uh, combinatorics, of course. Mm. Um, then we have um, we have two decision variables. Uh, uh, one decision variable is a binary one, and it basically uh, represents our decision about sequencing. Uh, but then we have a variable which is a star time of uh, measurement variable. This variable relates to scheduling uh, features of, of that model. So, and uh, that variable x, which participates in the constraints, basically we have um, some kind of um, network flow formulation for, um, for that problem. Uh, with uh, quite typical constraints that we uh, initiate a unit flow in our multi-layered graph uh, from a depot node, then the unit flow should finally arrive uh, back to the depot node. Uh, and in uh, intermediate nodes, there should be a balance, uh, so-called flow conservation constraints should be fulfilled. So, which means that uh, uh, we have uh, propagating uh, our unit flow through that multi-layered graph and we uh, uh, get as a result a uh, Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian circuit. So, there is also some uh, constraints uh, which are sort of uh, capacity constraints. So, they are also saying that in each intermediate step at most one unit of flow must propagate um, uh, through the time, two different time nodes, VIK and VJL. So uh, this is a network flow formulation. Uh, and this is uh, the constraints which relates to scheduling part of our model. Uh, basically, the most important constraints are here. So, if we have a link uh, with um, decision variable equals to 1, xij kl equals to 1, then we should have um, enough uh, time uh, which separates the start of processing at time slot k and time slot l. So these are uh, scheduling constraints and also sequencing constraints uh, deals with the uh, discretization of time. So and they are naturally place um, uh, our uh, scheduling variable SK uh, in the corresponding corresponding uh, discrete time interval. So um, again, we have binary. Uh, variables and we have uh, non-negative uh, real variables uh, which uh, tells us at which time we start uh, doing a measurement. So then uh, our task was actually to improve the solution uh, which currently exists in a common practice of that company. And uh, therefore, we were using um, real data um, and we were trying to kind of uh, build a model uh, which after optimization is doing better than, than the common current practice. So, and uh, for that, we have used a uh, kind of uh, time horizon half of the day uh, with, uh, for example, number of ships uh, 36. This is uh, particular data from, driven from uh, 5th of July. Um, and we uh, were testing uh, our solution against a uh, captain solution. So captain solution is quite a heuristic one. So basically the captain is uh, going to the working zone, uh, looking around, trying to find a uh, kind of nearest, uh, most suitable uh, vessel for measurement. Uh, kind of uh, greedy type of heuristic uh, is used by captain. 
So, and we want to show that our solution is better. So here is some small animation which I want to show you. Now we have two boats. This is our, this is our algorithm and this is um, um, common practice boat, uh, captain decisions simulation. Um, and as we, can, as we can see here, so we are able uh, to uh, catch all, uh, all the boats in this situation. In this example, uh, we are <coughs> able to make maximum possible uh, measurements with a total uh, distance equal to this number. So, uh, and at the same time, a captain solution can do half of, half of that, only 15 visits. So with a total, um, distance, uh, traveling distance, which is smaller, of course, smaller than, than our total distance, because the number of boats approached is twice less. Uh, however, uh, to make a um, comparison equivalent, uh, we uh, decided uh, to look <coughs> what our algorithm will do if we only want to visit uh, 15, uh, to do 15 me measurements, same amount, uh, as what captain is doing. So in this situation, we were able, we were able to produce a solution with a total distance 55, which is much, much smaller uh, than uh, the common practice solution. So uh, <coughs> then the goal was achieved, basically the um, solution uh, which is constructed by our Algorithm is a good solution, uh, but there is a, a problem. There was a problem, uh, and the problem was that if we want to uh, deal with um, higher horizons, uh, like uh, near 16 hours, uh, then uh, the time of, for solving uh, our model um, by solver uh, was uh, too high and it was not uh, uh, possible to get uh, an answer um, after uh, many, many hours of, um, co of uh, computational time. Therefore, we decided to think about what could be an easy way how we could um, basically split um, uh, our long interval into uh, shorter ones um, and calculate a solution on those shorter intervals and then glue them back to get together. So some kind of heuristic uh, which we call a time splitting approach uh, we were trying uh, to implement and the intuition behind that approach is uh, quite understandable so we can do splitting at those points where we expect <coughs> a minimum uh, violation of the global optimum so assume we have a global optimum and we need to split a time horizon into two intervals and let's find some point uh, where uh, we are breaking a minimum number of links in, a, in the global optimum, so in the potential global optimum. Uh, yeah. So therefore, uh, we basically introduce some uh, function uh, which is called sparsity function. Uh, sparsity function, sorry, and uh, this sparsity function uh, basically uh, average uh, the distance um, uh, the distance between uh, nodes in the, in the, in the uh, time slot k, which are available in, in, uh, uh, in, in that zone, and uh, scaled, this total distance <coughs> is scaled by the square of the number of uh, nodes pre uh, which are pr currently present at that moment. So, um, then uh, this green curve shows us uh, the number of uh, present nodes and uh, the blue curve is our sparsity function. So, and um, 
the splitting uh, point, uh, so here, for example, we again, we were looking at, at uh, the same uh, July 5 data set uh, and the time horizon, which is here, which is equal to 76 uh, time slots. So, and we were trying to, to test this hypothesis and to find uh, the best uh, splitting point. So, what is the best candidate? So, uh, the na uh, so-called naive splitting uh, would be to split just in the middle of interval without uh, basically taking into account information about sparsity. Uh, the second uh, idea, what if we will use uh, extrema of this function, so either maximum or minimum, uh, such that we can use th this maximum or minimum for splitting uh, the time horizon. So, and we decided uh, to test this idea empirically. Um, basically, scenario one represents splitting over maxima, scenario two over minima, and scenario three is a naive splitting. So, and here is a table which summarizes uh, results for one week uh, data um, and you can see here um, that there are some numbers which are bold fonted so um, <coughs> this means Pareto, Pareto points Pareto points for example let's have a look at the first row of this table so we are with scenario one with a uh, splitting over one extremer, so we have a uh, maximum number uh, of measured weak uh, vessels, 23. The uh, distance is 111. Uh, whenever in scenario 2 we have 22 uh, vessels measured with this distance. So uh, this, if we compare these two vectors, uh, they are mutually non-dominated vectors. We cannot say that one vector is better than the other vector or vice versa. But in scenario three, in this naive splitting, uh, we have a point 22, 103, and this point is uh, dominated, clearly dominated by uh, the point from scenario two. So because when we have the same number, the same number of um, uh, measured uh, vessels, but smaller distance in scenario two. Yeah. So then line by, by line, so we do such kind of comparison and um, again we marked all Pareto optimum, optimal, uh, Pareto optimal points in our table. Uh, interestingly that uh, naive scenario is not that, that bad in some cases. Uh, you can also get um, you can get uh, uh, points which are Pareto optimal in this situation just due to the fact that with naive scenario we were able to uh, generate, uh, generate a quite good uh, number of measured, measured vessels. So uh, then, of course, non-dominated points uh, are better than dominated points, but how to uh, <coughs> compare how to compare, for example, uh, this point and, and that point, which one, uh, which one is better. So for that, we basically used so-called normalized linear scalarization indicator, so which basically uh, aggregate two objective functions uh, with weighting coefficients, and weighting coefficients are one divided by the range of the objective functions. So weighting coefficients are uh, chosen exclusively for the purpose of um, normalization. Yeah? In, in that case, when uh, our normalized objectives are scalarized, we can uh, calculate one aggregated score, so, and then we can, uh, make, we can make a comparison. So, and certainly when we have a Pareto, we just put here uh, that this is one dominant solution and that's it, but when we have uh, two points to compare, we calculate this uh, linear scalarization indicator and the higher the value, the better. So
So then we can see um, that clearly scenario one and scenario two are quite competitive, competitive uh, scenarios. So um, in some situations scenario two is better, in some situations scenario one is better, but uh, splitting uh, using extrema of uh, sparsity function uh, better than naive splitting. In none of these cases, after using uh, this indicator technique, uh, in none of these cases, uh, scenario three is better than uh, splitting over over uh, over extreme. And then also uh, we can see that um, basically those time slots which have fewer nodes in the network but with a higher distance from each other, some kind of um, this type of sparsity happening, then we can clearly see that uh, these are the best candidates for, for splitting points. Scenario 2 was not winning um, all the time, so, but uh, uh, at some situations it was winning when the value of uh, R so was uh, locally, locally high value. So this all the observations uh, kind of we can, we can make. So, um, and this allows us to solve uh, basically, say, moderate size instances. Yeah, so again, so uh, with in integer programming, uh, we can solve uh, small to moderate size instances to improve uh, uh, to improve the running time for uh, moderate instances. Uh, we are using time splitting heuristics um, and we um, improve uh, the uh, kind of um, situation with calculating uh, in the moderate size instances. But still there are those large scale instances with time horizon uh, between like 12, 14, 16 hours, uh, which can be still quite challenging uh, for those techniques. And for to, to deal with such kind of uh, situation, so uh, it was a customized version of uh, bioobjective uh, genetic algorithm uh, developed. So this was a cooperative work with uh, Professor uh, Depp. So <coughs> may maybe you know that Professor Depp and his research group uh, actually they are creators of uh, non-dominated sorting genetic algorithm. So and. Uh, this is one of probably mostly uh, frequently used uh, evolutionary algorithms uh, in a practical optimization when you are dealing with uh, several objective functions. Of course, uh, in the multi-objective optimization, there is a huge number of those different, different types of techniques. But NSJ2 is a kind of one of the outstanding uh, techniques. Uh, the popularity of the techniques is due to its efficiency. And uh, at the same time, it is kind of um, open source. Uh, it's the code is available. <coughs> Everyone can uh, use it and can contribute uh, uh, for all own research using this, this code. Yeah. So, Therefore, we decided to, to use uh, this NSJ2. So, and the idea uh, to uh, basically to adapt uh, genetic algorithm to combinatorics, to combinatorial structure of our problem. So, and customize uh, several operators, basic operators, which are used in um, uh, genetic algorithms such as crossover, mutation, and uh, others, other um, operators. And then the idea also to, of course, to generate a high quality approximation of the Pareto frontier. So this is uh, our, our goal. Um, so, of course, uh, representing um, basically a sequence of location with time as a chromosome 
it's uh, basically not a big deal. We can um, actually uh, do it quite easily. So, of course, we have to keep in mind about uh, those feasibility of our solutions, and this is quite an issue because uh, uh, the tool uh, will be feasible if it is composed of admissible links, links which gives you enough time for processing and traveling uh, between two nodes. Yes. So then also, um, what kind of evaluation function to use as a fitness function to compare, for example, two solutions from uh, the same population. Uh, so we decided to use a value function which is quite uh, quite simple one, but at the same time easy to compute. And basically it's a, a, a scalarization function. This is a number of visits. This is a total distance taken with minus because <coughs> we are here minimize here maximize to convert it into maximization. We um, we have to use minus here and lambda basically a weighting coefficient which gives you priority um, of one objective over another objective. So if we set lambda greater than one, uh, then we will uh, prioritize uh, alpha objective over uh, that objective. So uh, a little bit manipulating with lambda um, is, um, is the idea behind that. So uh, initial population, um, this is probably most important uh, step in all the implementation. So because um, many genetic algorithms are known for their sensitivity to the quality of initial population. So if initial population of a good quality, then overall performance of the method is uh, superior to the situation when initial population is generated with um, some kind of uh, some kind of uh, drawbacks or some kind of uh, low quality. Therefore, uh, we basically decided uh, to invest computational time to the um, generating, uh, to the process of generating initial population. So, um, we were uh, used also um, some kind of randomization, uh, for example, uh, lambda values, those weighting coefficient values were uh, drawn randomly from a uniform distribution while creating the population. So uh, there are um, uh, many, many other things. Um, uh, basically the generation uh, is based on uh, applying backward recursion of dynamic uh, programming. So, and, but this recursion should respect um, or should include some, some features. So for example, only admissible arcs should be considered. And then um, uh, a node uh, which is added to a subtour, um, which has multiple visits should be avoided. Yeah, it shouldn't be repetitive. So we are trying to make a feasible solution uh, at the moment when we, we are creating a population, initial population. And then uh, each node has a, uh, some kind of probability to be eligible so, uh, for including um, to a subtour. So we are, it's also kind of a step with randomization, which basically associates some probability about 0 0.8 probability of uh, not the best node to be, to be included into a subtour not the best uh, note, but uh, still it's a sort of uh, simulated annealing idea. So then uh, we can accept uh, worse points, but with uh, some probability. So, um, okay. Uh, then uh, non-dominated sorting. So maybe I will just quickly uh, give you an idea. So, I assume you are familiar, familiar with this, but um, let's say we have by objective case, yeah, I will write here 
So we have objective number one, objective number two. Let's say we are minimizing, we are minimizing objectives, both objectives. So this is the direction, the general vector of by objective optimization uh, looking at this direction. So the Pareto, front, the Pareto points are those points uh, which are located here, also this point. So, and this is so-called the first line frontier, which we can denote like this. So, and in our, so assume we, these points represent the current population. So, and we want to rank our solution because for the purpose of uh, genetic algorithm, we need to rank our solutions. So ranking is done based on um, uh, calculating to which Pareto frontier the point belongs. So if it belongs to the first one, then it, uh, the point gets the highest rank. So then we exclude this point from consideration and then we build the second, the second frontier. This is F2, yeah, um, and then F3 and so on. If, so generally we have about 50 to 100 uh, solutions in our populations. So we can have um, somewhere from one to well, 10, 10 10 Pareto frontiers uh, in, in our ranking. So, and then uh, uh, the points uh, which belongs to the same uh, Pareto frontier, they could be ranked based on calculation of the crowded, uh, crowding distance. So basically we are looking at nearest neighbors and uh, those uh, points which belongs to crowded areas, so they kind of duplicate each other, so they get a kind of worse uh, rank. Um, that kind of crowding distance is calculated to, um, to rank points inside, inside the Pareto frontier. But what we can always say that points from the first Pareto frontier are always better than points from, from the second Pareto frontier. So, and this is the idea which we have, uh, we have also implemented here. So, um, uh, crowding distance uh, was calculated <coughs> by using this. So we measure basically the distance uh, in terms of uh, our objective functions, the distance to near to, to the neighbors uh, scaled by, uh, by the range. Uh, so basically normalization parameter of each objective function. So the larger uh, the, uh, the value of that measure, the, the better. So then the steps of uh, genetic algorithms, that they are of course quite standard. Uh, we start with uh, initial population where we generate a fixed amount of members in that population. And then when we do uh, propagation, uh, genetic propagations, we, uh, through the survival mechanism, uh, we basically keep, uh, <coughs> after each iteration, uh, the size of the population to be constant and equal to uh, pi members. Yeah? So uh, then, um, we do, uh, in, inside the population, we do non-dominated sorting based on calculation of frontiers and crowding distance. And then we have kind of a comparison of two solutions based on binary tournament. So, and uh, we basically uh, compare solutions, compare the ranks. So the one which belongs to the um, to the Pareto frontier with, lo with lower index will survive. If they are equal, then we calculate the delta, uh, and the one with larger delta propagates to next uh, next population. So, and then we apply a crossover operator. Uh, this is quite uh, technical things uh, which uh, we have to 
implement, we should keep an eye that um, basically uh, there are um, two goals uh, basically we want to achieve with a correct crossover. So we should uh, introduce, we should kind of introduce diversification, which is sufficient enough uh, that uh, in the next um, uh, population more uh, more kind of uh, good uh, solutions uh, will appear. So, and at the same time, we should um, keep good solutions somehow propagating um, from iteration to iteration. Um, so this is uh, done through several, uh, several, say, I would say rather technical uh, tricks. So I will probably uh, omit uh, this part. Um, so, uh, and then, um, of course, uh, replacement, insertion, a mutation, and sometimes we need to restore invisibility because uh, we may, uh, despite all these kind of um, uh, small conditions we, which we have to check, uh, we still may uh, have, as a result, in offspring some um, solution which uh, has some problem with feasibility and this uh, feasibility has to be to be restored so luckily it's not that uh, difficult to be to be done so and then um, so we basically generate uh, around 50 uh, 50 uh, populations and we want to see uh, basically what it gives us as a result what kind of outcome we get um, from applying genetic algorithm. So we uh, put our experiments in the following settings. So we consider all the time horizons up to the largest one, which is 16. So then we have um, corresponding number of time slots, just simply number of hours divided by five. Five is a um, uh, interval time discretization. And then we have a uh, total uh, number of ships uh, presented uh, in, the, in the area. So, and if we look at our model, ILP model, so we have corresponding number of constraints and especially so we are interested in looking at a number of variables uh, which are which is near to 1 million uh, if we are talking about instances with the longest, longest time horizon. So this is quite, quite challenging, uh, challenging numbers. Um, so, and basically they are motivation why genetic algorithm is, uh, is created. So then basically what we have to do, we have to create create some kind of uh, reference frontier. So for each uh, instance, we have to calculate Pareto optimal frontier by ILP model. So we basically uh, use Mosaic as a solver uh, and uh, we limit uh, the solver with uh, two hour running time. So, and we have, um, set relative gap tolerance uh, 0 0.01 for the experiment. So the experiment was done on a standard uh, uh, working station machine, Hewlett Packard, with 32 gigabytes RAM. So maybe not the fastest possible machine, but anyway. So um, then um, as we can see that after two hours, our solver was able to find uh, solution um, basically uh, in a number of cases where um, solution was not found uh, ranging from 29 to 39 if we look at instances with time horizon greater than eight hours. Um, so on one side it is um, kind of problem, but on the other side, um, we should expect something like this from, um, from long uh, time horizon instances. So, and let's see uh, how, at what actually we achieve when we apply um, genetic algorithm. 
So uh, first of all, uh, we uh, built a Pareto frontier. So here is blue points. They represent uh, the solutions um, optimal frontier built by, uh, by the solver, mosaic solver. And other points uh, here, colorful point crosses, they represent uh, basically after 7, 14, 21, and so on, uh, genetic iterations, how the Pareto frontier is improving. So here, uh, the scale of this picture unfortunately cannot uh, show you uh, the situation, but if you kind of zoom it, so you will see uh, much more clear uh, what uh, kind of improvement we get uh, when number of iterations is increased, I mean genetic it iterations. Um, what is interesting that, uh, as I told you, that uh, it was very important uh, for us to build um, to build uh, initial population of a high quality, and this is what also can be can be seen from from this curve. Yeah, that already at uh, initial it iteration we have quite uh, quite good good approximation. But anyway, anyway, uh, we are looking at the progress of the average relative error with number of iterations, and as we can see here. Um, kind of the change is quite quite significant. Uh, there are some situations when there is no improvement, some kind of we are doing some genetic iterations, but no improvement is reached, but then it goes sort of stepwise unless it's reaching uh, relative error value zero point roughly zero one, which is uh, uh, achievable after 50 uh, genetic iterations for the time horizon uh, instances of 14 hours. So, and um, this is a type of uh, relative error which is already um, uh, good quality, uh, good quality error, and um, we are kind of saying that uh, 50 is sufficient number of iterations uh, to be done. Of course, each iteration of genetic algorithm is usually time consuming and um, therefore we are interested in a convergence of our algorithm as soon as, soon as possible. Yeah? So then um, if we think about, um, again, uh, the table here pre uh, presents information about uh, comparing uh, running time and comparing results in terms of uh, number of measurements uh, which are done uh, by genetic algorithm and by solver. And this is column represents uh, the number of uh, cases when time limit two hours is hit by solver, which means that uh, after two hours we, we don't have yet exact optima, we have some approximated solution which we have truncated, uh, the solver has truncated it, so and we use that one as, as a reference. So the average uh, relative error for the, mm, uh, for the total distance and for the hypervolume, uh, hypervolume is a parameter which basically includes kind of both uh, quality of approximation and uh, the spread of the Pareto frontier. So this is a kind of um, typical characteristic of the quality of the approximation of the Pareto frontier, so which is also presented here. And we have uh, running time given in seconds. Um, as you can see, of course, uh, at the beginning, at the first line, so 50 uh, iterations of genetic algorithms gives us uh, this running time whenever for relatively small time horizon, uh, the solver is able to produce optimal solutions faster. 
but this is uh, the only uh, case when it happens. After that, as we see, the numbers are uh, very much different. So for, uh, for the solver, the totally in all the experiments, uh, the solution time is ranging from up to 39 hours and for the genetic algorithm, so up to two hours of CPU time. So, um, so we are able to uh, basically achieve um, 15 and 20 time of speed up with the genetic algorithm, uh, but at the same time, the quality of approximation <coughs> is quite high after 50 uh, genetic iterations. So we can conclude from these experiments that um, first of all um, this um, genetic algorithm provides a good starting solutions. Uh, this is one feature. The second one that convergence starts very early after several iterations, we already see a good quality approximation of the Pareto frontier. So then um, if we really want to achieve a good quality, high quality uh, approximation, we need uh, to let our genetic algorithm a little bit uh, do more iterations. In our case, <coughs> uh, with time horizon up to 16 hours, uh, we are able to achieve such quality after 50 iterations. So, and the optimal front is fully or almost fully covered. It means that basically, if we consider about spread of that Pareto frontier, so we are able to catch as many vessels almost as, um, as the solver does. And com the main reason that computational speed up is quite remarkable. So the computational speed up is ranging from 15 to 20 times faster for genetic algorithm compared to, to the solver. And again, we are not losing much in the quality of that approximation. So, um, when I started my talk, I was talking about uh, two main contributions, uh, but um, uh, my PhD student in her thesis uh, went beyond of this, uh, and there were two more papers published. Uh, they are relevant to the stochastic version of that uh, problem. So, and first uh, deterministic uh, model was um, extended to a two-stage stochastic programming model. So, and then there was a iterative randomized dynamic programming algorithm uh, with a convergence to global optimum of the stochastic programming model was developed. So, uh, this, uh, one of these papers uh, is published, another one is now uh, at the reviewing process at Azure. So, um, so altogether, uh, four papers were published, um, and uh, they represent our achievements in in this area, in this topic. So, um, this is uh, actually uh, all what I wanted to share today with you. So, uh, I hope I was good in time. So, and uh, thank you for your interest. Uh, uh, thank you for coming today and I will be happy to answer your questions. Um, uh, also, I put here some nice landscape from Finnish seashore. So, um, showing a uh, uh, kind of peaceful uh, Finnish environment. Uh, so, Oh, and well, you are also welcome to visit Finland sometimes. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah.
Well, for questions, we should use the, the micro. So uh, uh, somebody has uh, some question or remark or... One. Well, uh, just to break the ice, uh, <laughs> I have one question. Are all ships uh, equal in your model, or do you put some weights? For example, there may be some more polluting ship, uh, and maybe try to escape the surveillance. Uh, maybe you know, and you have to measure it, but at the same time, it takes more time because he's somehow flying. Uh, do, do you consider uh, weights in such a way? Yeah, it's, it's a good, good question. Thank you. So, and we were thinking about this, um, about giving priorities to ships. Um, um, especially we should give priority to those ships uh, where a captain was reading our papers and, <laughs> and, and he knows how our model behaves and he will start playing against our model, uh, then such ship should, should definitely be measured. Of course, it's a joke, but, um, well, in principle, um, uh, there is a restriction that uh, we can do only one measurement per, de per day for the ship and after that ship uh, should not be measured twice. Okay. So this is one limitation. Uh, the other one that uh, we basically, of course, if we have a big cruise uh, ship which uh, pollutes much more than a smaller vessel, so it would be good idea to approach that ship and measure it first. So, but this is kind of uh, biasing, uh, which we should not introduce, uh, kind of, I think it's not even correct uh, from a legal point of view, that uh, all ships should be treated uh, more or less equally, so in that situation. Um, also, we, there are such concepts as a class of ship, so, and we were talking only about ships of class A. Mm -hmm. so, so we do uh, modeling for measuring these ships. So they are some kind of uh, homogeneous type of ships uh, within the same class. Mm -hmm. So if we have ships from different classes, there might be a possibility to introduce some priorities. I, I agree. Yeah. Other questions? Just raise your hand if you would like to. So, Baltic Sea is not frozen yet. Let's break <laughs> the ice. I think that the, the, your, model, your model strongly relies on the itineraries, the predictions of the itineraries of the vessels. No, uh, Have you made or done some kind of uh, sensitivity analysis when the itinerary is just that the path is changed abruptly by the captain, how much influence, how much uh, influence can be in the final outcome? Yeah, and uh, sometimes such situation happens, of course, that uh, ships will deviate from predicted deviate. trajectories. And at some moment, ship just miraculously stops at one point and not moving anyway. Uh, we, and we don't know actually the reason what what is happening so there um, either they are giving way to a bigger ship or they are changing a route or they are, especially in that case uh, the problem happens uh, with smaller boats like uh, private yachts or um, those fishing boats um, uh, which has some, some motor, of course. So, um, uh, but uh, uh, with bigger ships, it happens uh, not that often. So they are more predictable in, in that case because they have a clear timetable and they have to obey this timetable. And if something uh, happens, uh, it means something really serious happens and unlikely sensitivity analysis uh, could incorporate this because this some means that some big event uh, happening which prevents ship from moving and it may take several hours to resolve this event. Um, uh, 
Of course, we've seen a uh, deviation from prediction uh, in, in our experiments. Uh, so, and we were trying, trying to kind of address it carefully. Uh, of course, through experiments, not, not theoretically. So, uh, yeah. Mm. Um, but I think this is more relevant to that paper, uh, which, uh, which is about prediction model. Uh, which was written uh, by another members of uh, our group, so that and we just used the model as a, as a ready solution. So, uh, but I think there is a, some kind of sensitivity uh, analysis in that paper as well. Yeah. Okay. Any other question or remark? Uh, okay. Um, hello. I would like to ask if the sensitivity you were talking about could be influenced by weather. I mean, strong winds could affect to the movement of all the boats, or do you think that since it's a small area and the wind should be more or less equal for all ships in the same area, it wouldn't have an effect there? Mm -hmm. uh, the wind is not a, a definitely a decisive factor uh, in, in this situation, um, but it, uh, plays important role in the situation when we want to approach the ship with a measurement boat. Uh, for example, then we should um, approach it from a correct side. And um, for example, there is a, a one of the restrictions which saying that a measurement boat should not pass uh, from the front uh, of that ship. Mm. So then we should uh, do it from the other side, which increase uh, the length of uh, the distance uh, the boat should, should have. Uh, but this is some kind of more related to approach, um, kind of uh, approach phase, um, which is not a part of this optimization model. Mm -hmm. This optimization basically looks gl more globally in what happens and this approach problem will look locally then when you are locally near the ship then to decide from which side you go and how long you stay or uh, what you do with the motor of your boat uh, should you just switch it off or keep keep uh, running so uh, then wind and some other things may uh, become a decisive factor but for that uh, routing optimization, uh, it's almost negligible factor. All right, thanks. Okay, one more. Well, if not, uh, we thank the speaker again. And thank you for your questions. <laughs> <laughs>